session on labor history. Um, now, if this were the university, that means I get to talk and you get to listen. However, we'll try to modify that format a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about general strikes. Actually, I want to generalize it a little more than that and talk about uh, mass strikes as well. Uh, I'll make these distinctions. Um, and and I, I was kind of hoping to have a, you know, a flip chart and do all that sort of thing, but it won't stay up. So take notes because there will be a quiz at the end. Uh, <clears throat> all right. When was the last general strike in the United States? 1946. 1946, 1946. 1946. Wrong. Three days ago. Three days ago? No. 1886. 1886. Though that, that was the most recent one. 2011. 2011. Where was that? No, actually it was in Puerto Rico and it was a few years ago. Uh, but. The point is well taken. We don't have many general strikes in the United States. <clears throat> general strikes, we're, we're probably being asked to do this today uh, because of a couple of things. One is that now there are lots of them in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, also because during the Wisconsin events, the South Central Federation of Labor, which is the Madison-based and surrounding counties Central Labor Council <coughs> raised the idea. They did not make a call for a general strike, but an important distinction. What they said was that, all right, we're in the midst of this struggle. We're confronting these incredible powers here, the, the state of Wisconsin, the billionaires behind the politicians and all of this. Uh, <coughs> maybe we should consider the idea of the general strike. So we're suggesting that people uh, study up on this, take a look at it, see what you think. Now, we know, of course, that it, it didn't happen in Wisconsin. And later on, <clears throat> it's not so much that I want to say why it didn't happen, as to tell you what one person on the Wisconsin panel this morning said that I thought was very interesting about how it might have happened. All right, general strike. <laughs> I want to make a distinction, three distinctions. General strikes of the basically top-down, explicitly political type. This is what you saw in Italy a week or so ago, Spain, Portugal, <clears throat> and so on. These are usually one-day strikes that are called by one or another or several central trade union federations in the country. They are explicitly these days, of course, about the austerity programs. I forgot to mention Greece. That's probably the most obvious one. Uh, <coughs> they are supported broadly, of course, but they are initiated from the center of the trade union federation <coughs> as a rule, which means two things. One, that this gives them legitimacy. Uh, <clears throat> and the second thing is, of course, that because they are initiated from the top, they can and usually are called off from the top as well. So here's a problem. Uh, keep this in mind for a while. The second type of general strike is what I would call a solidarity general strike. These are strikes that start not by a call from some central federation, whether it be local or national, uh, <clears throat> but that begin because workers in a, let's say, city, in this case usually, uh, see a group of workers that are on strike, they are being victimized by the police and the powers that be generally, uh, they may not be the strongest group of workers, they might be department store workers, as in the Oakland general strike <coughs> uh, in 1946. Uh, <coughs> they might be factory workers, they might be public employees. P 
people realize that their plight can become everybody's plight. And so it tends to kind of happen that one group or another says, well, we should do something about this, and they initiate it. And maybe eventually the Central Labor Council does call, make it official, and so forth. But it didn't really start in the center. It started from what we might call the, the periphery, the edge, uh, a small unit, even a craft unit. <coughs> um, and I think this is important because in the United States, most of the general strikes that have occurred here have been of that sort. Uh, and I want to go through some of the history of that. The third category, though, is what I'm going to call the mass strike. And this is not generally called from above. Uh, it doesn't necessarily involve the entire working class or the entire organized labor movement, but it has a kind of power that accomplishes often, not always, uh, what maybe these one-day general strikes can't. Uh, in part, because like solidarity strikes, it's not exactly under anybody's control. All right, a little history about these kind of strikes in the United States. The most famous general strike, of course, is May 1st, 1886. This was meant to be national. Uh, maybe three quarters of a million people actually left work on that day. It was called by the AFL. The idea was that on May 1st, this is the day when we tell all the employers that we are working only eight hours. This was not a demand for legislation. The experience of the unions in the late 19th century with legislation was a poor one. They could get things passed and the employers ignored them. Ten-hour laws, eight-hour laws, they couldn't enforce them. So they said, we're going to enforce this by having this national strike. Um, <clears throat> of course, they didn't win the eight-hour day everywhere. Some groups did. Uh, some groups won it and lost it won it again, uh, but it was a big step in the development of the movement for the eight-hour day, historically. Now, how did it happen? <clears throat> All right, I'm going to look at the city of Chicago. It was the epicenter of this strike. Uh, probably 10% of all strikers in the country were here. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, officially this was called by the American Federation of Labor. The Knights of Labor, who were also very much in growth at that time, uh, their leadership did not call it. In fact, they didn't support it. Although almost every district assembly of the Knights of Labor did support it and went on strike. So in Chicago you had the AFL, craft unions, you had the Knights of Labor, a mixture of craft and general unionism, and you had the Central Labor Organization. Anybody know what that was? No? That was the anarchist unions. Um, Eleanor Marx said they weren't really anarchists, they were revolutionary socialists. Well, the left naturally has to have a debate about what they were. But <laughs> the fact is they viewed themselves as revolutionaries. So here you have May Day, you had three organizations. They didn't like each other, any of them. Uh, you could be a dual member in some of them. Albert Parsons, who you might have heard of, was a dual member of the anarchist printers and the AFL printers. Uh, <clears throat> but generally speaking, these organizations didn't like each other. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, on this day, they all went on strike. Now, they couldn't even have the same meetings. They all marched together. Uh, the Germans and the Czechs, with the latest in breech-loading rifles, uh, the Americans and the English and the Irish unarmed, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
but they did march together. But they had to have separate meetings because neither the Knights nor the craft unions wanted to have the same rally with the anarchists and so on. So you can see the problem here. Yet the important thing is action. They took the action together. And that's the good thing about the general strike. The other thing about this general strike in Chicago, of course, is that while it was, quote, called by the AFL, if it had just been them, it would have been a small strike. So everybody got involved. It had a very strong grassroots element. People prepared for it. Uh, there were strikes beforehand and after. Of course, you know about the uh, hay market and all that. <coughs> so that was our first general strike. Uh, anybody know when the second wave of general strikes, these were local citywide ones, when was that? 1913. 1919, right. The most famous one being? Seattle. Seattle, Seattle. okay. Uh, Seattle, wonderful book on this, I recommend. It's an old one. <coughs> Harvey O'Connor's Revolution in Seattle. Why did he say revolution? This was just a general strike. It's mostly craft unions, AFL unions, some IWW. Well, because they they set up workers' councils. In fact, soldiers, sailors, and workers' councils. Now, what did that sound like in 1919? <laughs> yeah, right. <coughs> The local powers that be took note of that fact, of course, uh, and it was an important strike. It was a, a solidarity strike, not a called general strike. I mean, somebody eventually calls them, but it was already happening when it was called. Uh, <coughs> it's interesting because the spark that set it off was the arrest of an AFL socialist leader who was a war objector and who was arrested by the police. He was a well-known popular trade union leader. And when he was arrested, <coughs> various groups started, his union first, uh, started striking, and it caught on. Now, obviously, people had their own gripes, their own reasons for striking. But somebody had to set it off, some event, some group of activists, and so forth. So that's, that's the uh, important thing there. In 1919, there were similar, though less spectacular, general strikes in Springfield, Illinois, Waco, Texas, Kansas City, Missouri, and Billings, Montana. So here you had a kind of thing across the border in Winnipeg. Uh, so here you had a kind of, you know, not that the, they weren't coordinated or anything like that. But you had one of these eras when people go beyond the usual strike, the economic strike. And the other thing about these strikes, even though they began as most of them as economic strikes, by definition they became political. <coughs> They didn't ask to be political. They were politicized by the fact that the local authorities came down on them. They were politicized by the fact that their international unions came down on them. And most of them ended because of that. Some won some things, some didn't. Um, <clears throat> OK, that era of mass strikes, including steel, Packing. They were general strikes, but mass strikes uh, ended. The next wave, well, you know what that is, 1946. This followed the big industrial union strikes in 45 and 46. And again, it took place in about uh, six cities. And like 1919, most of these cities were middle-sized, small, middle-sized industrial cities. They weren't in New York, they weren't in Chicago this time, uh, <coughs> and so forth. 
Oh, I should step back and say, well, I, actually, I'll call them mass strikes. I'm talking about the mid-30s, uh, a little bit different. Um, these were, honest to goodness, general strikes. Started in solidarity with one or another group of workers who went on strike, were under enormous pressure, usually from the local authorities and particularly the police, uh, so people came out in support of them. Um, <clears throat> the most spectacular one was Oakland, I would say. Uh, there are some wonderful first-hand accounts by a person by the name of Stan Weir, the late Stan Weir, uh, <clears throat> who trained many of us in trade union ideas. Uh, <clears throat> any rate, they went out because there were department store workers on strike. Now, this is not your usual image of the industrial working class, all this great power coming out of GM plants and that sort of thing. Uh, department store workers. Maybe there's a lesson about that for us today, you know, that these things don't necessarily start where you think they're going to start. <coughs> so that was an important uh, way. If you want to read about this, this book called Rainbow at Midnight by, uh, I forget his first name, George Lipsitz. Lipsitz. George. Who was it? George Lipsitz. George Lipsitz. Uh, very interesting book. <coughs> any rate, now 1946, okay, you had six of these general strikes, citywide strikes. Um, what happened the next year? 1947? Yeah, and what was one of the big things in Taft Hartley? No secondary strikes. What were these things? Secondary strikes. Uh, this was obviously not an accident. We think of Taft-Hartley primarily in terms of the big industrial unions and debanging them. Uh, and of course, it was meant to do that as well. Uh, but in particular, these conservative Republicans and Democrats who put this thing together uh, <coughs> were aware of these general strikes. And this was a frightening concept because 1946, this looked a little too much like Europe. You know, we're not supposed to look like Europe. Uh, but here it was, these general strikes going across like things you might have seen in France or someplace <coughs> like that. Uh, <coughs> it looked a little too radical. Uh, and of course, these kind of strikes do politicize people. No, no question about it.